All right, here we go. Three, two, one, shaka bra. After the last Ask Max Tone series. it down, tone it down. <laughs> You're yelling. Hmm. All right, here we go. Hold on, I gotta calm myself down then if you need me calm. All right. <sighs> After the Ask Max series. <laughs> Start again. That, that level of calmness? Yeah, just All right. regular. After the last Max... <laughs> After the last... Ask Max series. Try saying that. <laughs> yeah, that is so hard to say. <laughs> Easy for you we, to say. Yeah, we decided to switch the format up a little bit. So what we're going to do is we picked four questions that we thought were um, that we could answer in four minutes that took a little bit more time to answer. And then at the end of those four, we're going to have four minutes of rapid fire and we'll try to get through as many of the questions as we can. And all these were from Instagram. Yeah, they're all from the Instagram post that was dated... Four days ago. Sometime earlier this week or last. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you ask and then I'll start it? Yeah. You ready? Right. Oh. Hit it. No, no. You ask first. I okay. get four full minutes to, to answer. Mm, okay. <laughs> All right. So question from Austin Whistler. If the strongest power lifters rarely implement tempo work, why do you favor tempo work so much? Let's assume it's for a client with no previous injury background. Lane Norton and Greg Knuckles have written how Poliquin overuses tempo work. Go. Okay. All right. So first, uh, I'm not yeah. sure. I don't know if I've ever met Austin Whistler or spoke to him, but I'm not sure where the uh, where the insinuation that I use a lot of tempo work comes from. I do use tempo because it has certain applications. Uh, specifically overloading the eccentric and people that need to hypertrophy or improve tendons. And I think to groove neural patterns, a lot of people that are really quick in their motion from a lot of speed work and a lot of Olympic lifting can start to get knee pain and start to get ankle pain from just bouncing on soft tissue a lot. So sometimes it could be used as a control mechanism to uh, time athletes or to time athletes and use their speed of contraction coordinated with their breath cycle. So for me, tempo is a tool that can be used at specific times in the year for specific athletes for specific purposes, but it doesn't go in all strength training programs. The other kind of follow-up is I'm not sure that Lane Norton or Greg Knuckles or really any specific high level achiever and what they were able to accomplish with their style of training and their methodology should ever be used as a barometer for whether or not a tool is effective. Their personal take on Poliquin using too much tempo. I've been through his courses, but I think I'd need to evaluate whether or not his current programs for the athletes that he's using it for like, is it working? Is it not working? Are they improving? Are they not improving? Like, I'd have to have some context to be able to say whether or not I agree with that. I know um, about, I think I was during the open, I watched a SWIS video of Ed Cohen teaching the power lifts, who's probably the best power lifter of all time. And he was explaining that one of the things that he does to reinforce his technique is put the barbell on his back and go through 10 second down, 10 second up, slow controlled squats uh, to ensure that his positions, his technique, where the tension is on a regular basis is like, it's kind of like a warm up for him and like greasing the groove when he can't go heavy or when he's injured to have some sort of control in his training. So uh, that kind of debunks the thought that the best power lifters in the world don't use tempo. I think some use tempo, some don't use tempo, some people lift on a fast tempo, some lift on a slow tempo, some people don't need to be using tempo because they're dynamic athletes that don't need to do any slow training. So uh, all strength training to me is just uh, what's the task that they need? What's the physiology that they have? What's the training background that they have? What's their injury history? All right, now that I have that information, what tools do I have in my toolbox that I think are most effective that will make the training gains that I want in this specific athlete? I don't have strength programs, quote unquote, that I write on a regular basis or everybody needs to follow this. I just like, I take everybody as an N equals one case study and tempo is just one of the tools that I use depending on uh, what the athlete needs to get better at. Awesome. All right, on time. Yeah, man, Stop. plenty of time to spare. Reset. All right, next one, let me pull it up. 
that was so non climactic. <laughs> Didn't even get challenged on the time. I'll do. I'll do better about the celebration. <laughs> All right. So um, Alex Kittle asked, "Have you ever had an athlete with a messed up hormone profile? After making the proper lifestyle changes, how long does it take before the hormones come back to normal?" Sorry if the wording is off. All right. Yeah, the answer to the question in a simple way is yes. I have had athletes that I've worked with that have had. Um, strange hormonal profiles. I think, uh, actually, Mike just read a book about blood work and... Mm -hmm. Your blood uh, never lies. Yeah, your blood never lies. That might be a good thing to read so people can get some context on what the specific markers mean. Um, One thing that I think the, the question initially pops up in my head, the thought that what is a messed up hormonal profile? Uh, if, is it deviating from what people say is normal? Is it that the, you're off the reference ranges just a little bit? Are you really far off the reference ranges? Are people going to functional medical doctors who have their own subset of what optimal hormones look like? There's a lot of uh, fighting, argument, debate as to like what is optimal. And I think people don't realize that w- what reference ranges typically are is an aggregation of the data that that lab has brought in and then they use some sort of algorithm to determine like how far in a standard deviation from one side is normal. Uh, You should know if you're trying to be an athlete that you're probably going to push yourself into specific abnormal ranges and then you need to work with your doctor specifically to determine, okay, well, is this something that's going to mess me up long term and going to hurt me or is this something that is genetic and hereditary? Is this something I need to worry about? Is this something that's being caused by my training? A lot of people don't ask the questions. They get a little bit of data and then they're like, I'm broken. Mm -hmm. And now they're waiting to go through the process to be fixed. I've seen people that have had abnormal lab values that have operated on a high level for years and years and years. And the doctors thought there was nothing wrong with that. It's Mm -hmm. like, hey, well, this is what your blood work is going to look like while you're training in this style and you can correct it when when you remove that stress from your body. And then some people that went and made all the lifestyle changes and tried to change everything, change their behavior and nothing changed at all. So it's kind of a, it's an unknown thing. I think you got to work with an expert that has experience both with the endocrinology on the internal, like on the internal medical side. Mm -hmm. And then also that has some experience with the specific athletic pursuit you're going into because they're just really, it's really hard to take 7.7 or whatever the population billion people and then say, well, this is normal or this is optimal. And then within that, we operate within this broader context of society. And we wanna be athletes who are doing novel things at the highest level of stress possible and then expect that everything on the inside looks normal or healthy. The reality is the best in the world that are doing this probably are so stress resilient that their hormonal profiles look good. I mean, I know I just had Travis get blood work and you know he's healthy as a horse. There's nothing out of the reference range, which means that the stress of training to mm-hmm. him is so low relative to what his hormones can take. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've seen other people that train in half the volume that are just like slaughtered on the inside. So there's no like, cookie cutter formula that says, hey, if you go for this period of time doing this, you're going to be beat up. And then like to get out of that, you need to do this. So um, unfortunately, that's a real it depends answer. I was was just about to say that. Uh, I think it's a good point, too, with we have 25 seconds left. So I want to add some with getting multiple opinions, because I've had blood work done in the past as well, checking hormone profile. And one the doctor that actually helped me sit down and look over the lab work, you know, suggested like, you've got some testosterone levels that are out of whack. And then I go to someone that's in the field working with athletes and he's like, no, for the sport that you're in, this is actually really normal based on everyone that I've seen. So yeah, it definitely pays to get a couple of different opinions. Bam. All right, next one. Hold on. This man said healthy as a horse. (laughs) Did he really? I missed that. Are horses really healthy? Uh, maybe. Seem to be you said it like you were a, like. Proud. Isn't that a quote? Healthy as a horse. I think they're pretty healthy. They eat, what hay all day and they're jacked. Yeah. Is that just because the alliteration there? Healthy horse. Yeah, I guess so. <clears throat> I kind of I call Travis a show pony all the time, so maybe that's why. Speaking Are of horses, horses, we'll get to one of those. Questions. I don't know. I would unsubscribe so fucking fast. If I-, <laughs> <laughs> I just lost them. <laughs> all right. Next question from uh, Fuel Your Pulse. 
Can you discuss the future plans of the educational course offered by TTT? Oh, yes. Do you need four I minutes can. for this? I don't know. I don't think so. All right. So currently, every Tuesday and Thursday, we are filming. We are current bright and early. Bright and early, <laughs> 7 a.m. We're filming the energy system course and the movement course. We're going to finish all the filming, review all the courses, create all the course materials, refilm anything that needs to be refilmed to make sure that it's polished. And the plan right now is to launch those prior to having finished the other three. I don't know if we'll change that by the time they actually launch, but stay um, updated on our Instagram, YouTube. Like that's where we'll kind of launch them and, and explain like what the process looks like moving forward. After that, we are definitely going to do the strength. And I'm not sure yet which order we are going to do assessment and exercise physiology. Some of the stuff that's in the movement course and in the energy system course is expanded upon in the assessment course. So we've already started blowing out some of the materials that are in there. Uh, at the conclusion of all five of the courses being done, we are going to finally, I know I've been talking about it for years, formalize some sort of a mentorship program that ev that anybody who's taken all of the courses can go into. And I know the theoretical knowledge from education and from the discussions that comes in the courses is not always the same as what's it like when you actually go through an assessment on site at TTT or, you know, like seeing what an athlete's program looks like or uh, having an athlete and having an external coach look at it with a little bit more experience and say, hey, you know, I might have done this, I might have done this, I might have done this. So that's the plan for the five courses. I don't know what the timeline looks like because my goal with the new courses is to make them as good as I possibly can. And um, I think me and Chris and Evan and Kyle and the other coaches who are going to contribute and watch them prior to us launching them are going to be super critical to make sure that they're as good of a final product as we can possibly put together. So uh, we're going to focus on the quality of getting them done before we actually launch them. And, and they're an update on the, they're not just an update on like the format, which is definitely what we're doing now, but it's also yeah. updated content. So it's not yeah, just y'all saying yeah. that. So it's, yeah, so the last, the last course format was either me or Kyle standing in front of a camera and just discussing. Now the format's going to be a lot more interactive. There's dialogue. All three of us are presenting, giving, uh, this is how I think about that issue. This is how I think about the issue. We've actually changed our models. Like our energy system models are entirely different. The movement course, I completely changed. Basically all the science that is in the current movement course is condensed into one section here. And then everything else is getting put in the science of training course. So this is now like, instead of being movement theory and just a definition of what movement is, it's actually, how do you change movement? What movement tools are there? Um, what movements in the market sport? And like, it's just a completely different way of trying to educate people on the problem. Did y'all decide if you're going to give the people who bought the first one the free Yeah, update? so anybody who currently has the course for this update is going to get the updated course. Um, that's just kind of a thank you that I think uh, something that when I was a little bit less popular and less known, I put out these products and they were expensive and there were people that jumped on board and were like supported my brand and helped this thing come to fruition. So it's kind of like my thank you to that group of initial people that was the support structure for getting this started. So they're going to get the courses for the second iteration and then um, that should be lasted in its current form with updates as we go for a couple years as we get like certifications and um, mentorship program up to speed. Dang! Nice. I saw you looking at the clock. I was like, I was hey, starting to sweat. Uh, come on, come on. Didn't know we needed all four minutes. Very cool. Uh, did, did you go into the Instagram and ask that? No. You just want to put I a little commercial yeah. in the fucking show. Yeah. I'm going to plug my own stuff. Yeah, you probably do I don't that even know. Yeah. Tonight. yeah, I don't even know who that guy is right now. Do I? Who is that? Fuel Your Pulse. Oh, that's not a name. Yeah, so. that's, that's your fake Instagram account? <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, that's never, actually never heard of that name. Yeah. Mm, who yeah. is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready for the next one? Yeah. All right, Coach CFB asked, do you use some data for measure work like trimp monotony strain by RPE? You or Evan use? If so... Could you explain how changes in training regards volume intensity? 
I don't uh, actually, slightly broken. Yeah, I don't. But. I think it was the next question that we had decided that that guy asked that we were gonna ask, right? Um, do you use some data? No. No. What was the next one. question? All right, using MED principle. Minimum effective dose, right? Yep. Yeah, I think that was the one we wanted to talk, and I okay. wrote the wrong thing down. All right. I could answer that other question, too, but I, honestly, I, I wasn't entirely sure what he was asking from the grammar. <laughs> yeah. Let's just go to the next one. Okay. Yeah, we'll go to the next yeah. one. Go Sorry, man. One. All right, so using MED principle, minimum effective dose, I assume you did test for, see if the athlete adapt or not. <laughs> how, uh, how do you know this is the right dose or not? Too much thinking about interference and residual effect. Okay, so hold on. Let me just... I'm not entirely sure what's being asked, so I'm going to reiterate the question and how I'm interpreting it and then answer it afterwards. So he was saying, um, how do you monitor whether or not somebody is getting the minimal effective dose of training? That's what I took, yes. Okay. All right. All right. So to first go into how I think about training is I, I differentiate between academic theory and real world training. Academic theory can come up with principles of supercompensation that like look very linear, right? Like here's what your organism can tolerate. You put some stress on the training, their adaptive capacity goes down, they recover, and now they're more fit. In the real world, the adaptation is happening on like a bunch of different systems that all have different recovery timelines and are like, what's going on in their life, how they're thinking, what their stress profile looks like, what their nutrition is like, how much massage they're getting is all influencing the speed of that recovery. Mm. And there are traumatic events from a training perspective th that are so stressful to somebody that they cannot compensate and adapt to. And that's like the, t the, that's the timeline, that's the end of their career. It's like, okay, well, there's too much. I can't go any farther than this. I can't continue to progress. So in the real world, things are a little bit more gray and messy. With regards to minimum effective dose, um, with an athlete, you have to figure out with this specific athlete, what are the markers that you're looking at that are a proxy for overtraining? So there are people that say like, there's no such thing as overtraining, that doesn't exist, that's just an academic thing. Then there's other people that say like, no, it's a real thing, this is how you measure it academically, this mm -hmm. is what it looks like. For me, I'm like, okay, well, let's say overtraining is what the person can't handle. Let's say there's uh, disruptions in sleep that affect their mood that are so bad that they, they can't be happy if they're sleeping with that low of a quality. Let's say it's uh, digestive function issues where they're getting diarrhea on a regular basis, or say it's mechanical pain. Let's say it's a feeling of sluggishness and heaviness before training like there are these patterns that emerge mm -hmm. when you're dealing with a person and when you're focused on that person and when you could recognize the patterns over and over and over again that's what you use as your barometer for whether or not you dosed them too heavily and if you go into that you have to regress then on the other side of that equation is not giving them enough stress to adapt and the only thing that you can use to measure that whether or not you hit a dose that caused adaptation is testing and retesting. So if they're not getting better at the things you need them to get better at, then your dosing was not, not effective for creating the adaptation. So on one end, you have markers of overtraining, and on the other end, you have markers of undertraining. The minimum effective dose would theoretically be at the top end of the, of the not stressful enough range. But it would be impossible to quantify and mm. measure that. I mean, you can have tools like Omega Wave, daily blood work, like to figure out if you're overstressing the system, but most people don't have access to that. And truly, most of the best athletes in the world are not using tools like that to create their adaptations. So the only thing that you can do is, is play the conservative long game, give them an amount of training that's stimulating adaptation, Know that when you're hitting that, like those overtraining markers that you're pulling back and theoretically at that time it's too much and then slowly try to build up again to see if their adaptive capacity has increased. But that is the art of coaching. It can't be read in a textbook. It can only be learned with experience and you have to know what you're looking for in the first place. So just using a term like minimum effective dose is like, okay, cool. Yeah, we're all striving for that, but actually doing it is something that just comes with experience. Yeah. You got to pay close attention.
Got it. Man, wow. Five <clears throat> seconds. Not in Pena. Yeah. All right, so we'll do some rapid fire now. Um, I'm going to start from the top. Okay, so this one I'll just start. Yep, and four minutes. We're going to get through as many what of these as we can. What happens if I start rambling on one of the rapid fires for the, too long? Did you get long. four minutes? So basically in the, the previous format, we did whole episodes of rapid fire, but I, I right. decided not to. So this I'm going to try minutes. I'm gonna try to answer these quickly. So if any of these questions you wanted a long one, I apologize in advance, but I want to get as many of them as I can. I think if you want to go long, do it. It's just you only got four minutes, fool. All um, right. Uh, there are a couple in here that we're going to expand on in another video. Video. So okay. if I start to read one, just be like, stop, we're going to go to the next one. Cool. Because that is one we're expanding on further. All right, cool. Oh, I don't remember what those bottom ones are, so you'll have to re remember those. Oh, I'll do my best. Okay. It's a shit show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're so organized here. <laughs> All right. I feel like this is something simple we're making so <laughs> It's because confusing. you printed the questions before we got all We've the got, questions. Yeah, new questions, a timer. we got like six people running this. Are you good? Yeah. All right. Three, two, one, go. All right, Bruno Kokoro asked, Hi, Training Think Tank, which books about training prescription do you recommend? Oh, we actually just did a book review series. I don't, that's a very broad question. Don't call question. it the book review series. Yeah. You know what we're calling it. Yeah, <laughs> Reading Train Book. Reading Train Book. <laughs> uh, Super Training is probably my favorite one to reference because I feel like so many people reference it and haven't actually read it. And it probably has the most comprehensive body of training information from cover to cover in just one text. Cool. All right. Angry Brad asked, would you ever consider playing Lex Luthor in a Superman movie? <laughs> I'm the worst actor ever. God. Like Chris, Chris has seen that firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> we, we tried to get him to play Carl Winslow once. Actually, yeah. he did pretty good. Has that episode came out yet? I have you. No. I guess not. I don't think so. Okay, well. <laughs> it's a rare condition this day and age to read any good news on the newspaper page. All right, uh, was that the end of the question? You yeah. never answered. Yes, I, yes no, no, I would not do that. Okay. Anyone came after and asked <laughs> he didn't me that. answer his question. <laughs> Danny Ocean asked, do you ever find it beneficial for individual design athletes to join a group class on occasion? Conversely, how do you coach someone transitioning from group classes who may have a hard time with motivation or giving it 100% effort without the competitive environment a class tends to offer? I think I answered something very similar to this before in another mm -hmm. Ask Max, but um, I think that if, first of all, you have to have a source of motivation that uh, Make, allows you to push yourself when you are by yourself. But I do think that you need to get into an environment that you're competing with other people. Uh, I generally ask the question, a lot of people that get out of group classes, they're not actually missing training with people, they're missing winning. And if they're constantly winning in the group that they're in mm. and they wanna get better, that's an issue. You have to be exposed to an environment where you have some people that are right at your level and you have some people that are way ahead of your level so you know what you have to accomplish. So I uh, ask a lot of questions about what it is about the group that people are missing. And uh, I take that on a case by case basis. Some people just aren't in an environment that allows them to train with other people and they gotta do their own thing. And some people I'll blend the design to allow them one or two days a week where they get after it with mm -hmm. their group. Cool. Do you remember the video that you could reference to so they could maybe catch some more on that? I don't. Okay. All right, next question. Um, MJ Spinar asked, are the days of the regional competitor who works a 40-hour work week, a standard desk job, coming to a close? I mean, Fikowski took second at the games, so I would say that the answer to that question is no, not yet. Okay. <laughs> 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 Um, our Migley something asks, do you, Max, have performance parameters or prerequisites that you use as a guideline for determining if an athlete is a good fit for your coaching or is it more about mental fortitude and performance? I know you spoke about how Travis Mayer was a high-level athlete before and now Noah Olson is on board. What is that consultation process like? Well, Travis wasn't a high-level athlete before. Um, the consultation process for me is about whether or not I get excited about the concept of coaching the person, which isn't always a, a talent thing. It could be where they're, you know, 
where they are, what the issue that they're dealing with is, uh, what it could do for my business, what it could do for my training environment. I don't think I have any concrete, like you have to be this type of person to be part of my organization. We have regular people and we have professional athletes all in the organization. I do think that there's a mind state with regards to progress and approach to training and thinking about training that we look for, but you don't really know whether or not that's a good fit until people start in the organization. Mm. Quick, one more. Cool. Last one. Why is a shoe called a shoe from Jay Lancaster? That's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good wrap-up. <laughs> All right, so uh, there's, a, there's a bunch we didn't get to on that one. We'll uh, try and finish those in the next video. Yeah. Cool. Sweet.